Welcome to Baku International Fellowship. We are an English speaking, multinational, multidenominational, family and faith, growing in a loving relationship with God and each other. At BIF, it's, it's always, always all about, about Jesus. Jesus. Hello, BIF family. Welcome to our worship gathering this morning. You know, God's word tells us that we're to enjoy the companionship of those who call upon the Lord with pure hearts. And uh, you just saw our hosts this morning uh, inviting you and uh, celebrating their coming together. Uh, a few of our BIF friends were able to get together at a restaurant this week and uh, celebrate the, the goodness of God together. And and we will really, really want that to happen for, for all of us. We are in the process of trying to put together home groups. And uh, earlier this week, I sent out a, an email that I understand a lot of you did not receive. Uh, and we're going to keep repeating that email until everybody gets it. And uh, we are you, you understand the process that we're going through to try to form uh, home groups throughout the coup. Um, understand that uh, a lot of your email servers will look at our email and discern that it's some kind of spam and they put it in the spam folder. So if you could uh, make sure that our email address, my email address and uh, the church's email address are in your acceptable email file uh, so that they come into your inbox and don't get dumped into spam. Also, some of you uh, are still not getting an, an email. This might have been forwarded to you. Uh, there'll be a link in, in the uh, uh, in some of your emails, and we may, we may try to get it even on this video, of a place where you can go to sign up to make sure that you get those emails uh, on a regular basis. Um, we want to see us to come together, and, and we need some hosts. That's the, that's the step one of that process. And so if you're interested in hosting a, a home group in, in your place, your apartment, or your house on Sunday mornings, uh, email me and I'll send you uh, information about what is going to be needed and how we're going to go about that. Uh, but, but get in touch with us and, and we will begin that process. That's step one is getting a, a list of hosts who are willing to uh, gather people in their homes on Sunday mornings. Uh, this week has been difficult. Uh, it's hard. Uh, a lot of you uh, know people who have been uh, sent to the front lines of the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia and just living in a country that is at war, uh, it is a disturbance to our souls. And rather than become more agitated and more uh, concerned, we need to turn to God. Uh, the process here is to, to cry out to God. And, and the psalmist does that. In Psalm 46, he says this, it, that God causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spears. He, he burns the shields with fire. Friends, we have a God who nothing is out of his control. Everything is possible. As, as impossible as the, the conflict seems there, uh, we love and we serve and we worship a God uh, who is sovereign and who is powerful and, and can end this. So I invite you to just take a moment and join with me in praying for Azerbaijan, uh, for this conflict, and for God uh, to do what is impossible for man to do. It is possible for God. Let's pray. Father, we come to you out of a world that is once again at war. And Lord, you have looked upon this world and, and seen wars and wars upon wars upon wars. And, and Lord, we, we know that you have ended a number of those wars. You have brought to, to conclusion uh, by your power, by your sovereignty. And, and right now, looking at the, the conflict here, we, we don't see any human kind of resolution to this. We, we see only more bloodshed and more conflict and more bitterness and anger. And, and Lord, we come to you uh, because you tell us in your word that you are a God who ends wars. And we are cry out to you for to do the impossible, to do that which man cannot do. How often uh, skeptics came to Jesus and said, uh, uh, this is impossible. And Jesus responded, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And so we cry out to you, God, out of a, a world of conflict uh, for you to bring your peace to 
uh, this world. And we ask God that you would stop the bloodshed, that you would stop the, the fighting and the, the bitterness and the anger. Lord, do the miraculous in this conflict today. Uh, we ask God your protection upon people. We pray for citizens uh, that are being involved in the crossfire of this and ask God for your protection and your care for them. We pray for the wounded, that you will uh, heal their wounds and restore them. And we pray, Lord, for the, the emotions of people that are, are being torn apart by, uh, by all that is going on. Lord, help us as a church to be an agent of peace. Help us to be a, uh, a place of healing and a place, Lord, of restoration for the soul. We come to you, God, and, and today we come with this heavy heart. And yet, Lord, even in the heaviness of our heart, we find a God who is worthy of our praise. And so as we venture into worship with our song, we pray that you would empower us by your spirit to worship you as you deserve to be worshiped. Help us, Lord, to lift our hearts to you. And, and Lord, may this time of worship heal our own hearts. May it also encourage us and embolden us. Help us, Lord, to see the, that our Father in heaven is a great and awesome God who cares and loves us. And, and Lord, you love and care for this world, too. And so we pray, Lord, for a, an outpouring of your Spirit's work to enable us uh, to be the church that cries out to God and worships you in spirit and in truth. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this morning, we've gone back into the archives. We had a, a little bit of a problem getting our musical worship lined up this week, and so we've gone into the archives, and uh, Ryan and Krista are going to lead us uh, in worshiping the Lord in song this morning. May he bless you. May he encourage you. May the Lord give his blessing to your heart and your life as you lift him up and praise him today.
mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up to the day my head. Oh, I will see of the goodness. Good morning, BIF family. It's uh, good to be with you uh, this way, anyhow. Uh, we have lived through what uh, I would consider to be a pretty surreal 
uh, week uh, this uh, this past week, and and uh, we've been praying for you and uh, trusting God to to carry us through this rather strange time uh, that we're living in. I want to go back to talking about prayer again because uh, it is one of the most fundamental, most important parts of our Christian walk, our, our life with God. I've asked a couple of questions along the way. When's the last time you really experienced the, the power of prayer in your life? I've, I've asked the question, why do you pray? I'd like to ask this question of you today. How, clo how close does God feel to you today? There's been surveys taken of that kind of question. And I'm sure that there's some of you out there who would say, oh, I've needed God's closeness and I've, I've just longed for God's closeness during this past week, especially, and he's never felt closer. Great. I imagine that there's a, another group of people that are thinking through that question and saying, I, I haven't felt the closeness of God for a long while. My prayers go up to heaven and they just kind of bounce off the ceiling and come back. But in every, uh, every survey that's ever taken, the, the largest number of people, believers in Jesus Christ, who would answer that question, how close to God do you feel? They would answer not close enough. I wonder about you today. The disciples saw something in Jesus that indicated that there was a, a much closer relationship to God than they were experiencing. And they wanted to know how to pray. They wanted to know how to have that kind of experience. I wonder about that question, why do you pray? How have you answered it? I, I hope that that question has kind of rattled around in your mind for a while this week and over the past several weeks. More than that, um, why does God want you to pray? I think that the, the main reason why God put into our spirits, our soul, this desire to, to talk with him, to commune with him, is that we would have a personal intimacy with God. Intimacy. It's a word that carries a lot of different feelings and thoughts for a lot of people. But if you look it up in a thesaurus, try to find words that are related to intimacy, you'll find the word closeness, you'll find the word caring, you'll find things like familiarity. I want you to think about what it would mean to be intimately, personally close to God. There is a closeness. I think probably the best synonym, synonym uh, for Intimacy would be closeness, to be close to someone. You know, when Danita was back in the United States for 10 weeks this past summer, I think there were only five days that we weren't able to uh, FaceTime or, or do some kind of call with a, a video call of some sort. And, and oh, how we thank the Lord for that kind of technology, to be able to have at least that kind of, of connection uh, with one another through that time of separation. Some people would think of, prayer as being some kind of phone call or a telegram or a, a, a WhatsApp message or FaceTiming. And you think of the degrees of closeness in those kind of terms. But, but I'll tell you that that Sunday morning that I went out to the airport to pick up Danita and brought her back home and we stood in that lobby and hugged, that was intimacy. That, that was a closeness. We, we were together. And I think that's the the, the, the idea that God has, he doesn't want us just to be communicating. He wants us to be together. Prayer is a place to meet with God. Moses met with God in, the ta in that tent of meeting. And God even described it as someone that sometime that they met face to face. I want to meet face to face with God. God wants to meet with me. He wants to meet with you face to face. How do I get there? That's the question that I think the disciples were wrestling with. How do we get to that place where there is this intimacy, this closeness with God? Well, when they went to Jesus and they saw how Jesus had, had this closeness, they said that they recognized that the, the key to that closeness was his prayer life. And they asked Jesus, they asked Jesus, teach us to pray. 
we've been looking at a couple of different um, gospel accounts of, of what the disciples may have, have observed in Jesus that gave them an indicator that, hey, this is the path to that kind of intimacy, closeness with God. And so we have two stories. They're actually back to back in the Gospel of Luke, the end of chapter four and the beginning of chapter five. And we've asked the BIF drama team to once again uh, show us and help us to, to live in the sandals of those uh, first century uh, believers and see Jesus in prayer. The next morning, Jesus departed and went to a desert place. Yet the crowds were seeking him and they came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But Jesus said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns too, for this is what I was sent to do. So he continued to preach in the synagogues of Judea. Now Jesus was standing by the lake of the Gerasenes, and the crowd was pressing around him to hear the word of God. He saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of those boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from shore. Then Jesus sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and lower your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked all night and caught nothing, but at your word I will lower the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets started to tear. So they motioned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they were about to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For Peter and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's business partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. So when they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. Well, once again, we thank our BIF uh, drama group for helping us live in the, live in the, the context of the scriptures. Uh, we saw two different stories. One was where Jesus was literally, literally praying. They saw the effect of it. The other one uh, isn't so much about prayer, but it is about yielding to God. See, first of all, prayer is a place to align our priorities with God. That's what they saw in Jesus' prayer. They, they were in Capernaum, and Capernaum was a, a great city to, to spread the word. The, the soldiers all came there. It was a commerce center. Uh, the word about Jesus would have spread all over the then known world through that little town called Capernaum. And God was doing amazing things through Jesus. Jesus was, was doing some amazing things in Capernaum and, and people were very excited. They, they, they stayed with him through the evening and then they went to bed and then Jesus got up before everybody else and went out to a, a desolate place and he prayed. He wanted to get the, the father's priorities for him that day. And evidently the, the father told him the priority today is not Capernaum, it's other towns. And while it would have been easy for him to, to stay there in Capernaum and, and just kind of hang out and, and watch the ministry grow, he was about to do the Father's will. How often are we more influenced by our successes than by the words of the Lord? Uh, um, Certainly, we want to be successful. We want to be productive for Jesus. But are there times when the applause of people drown out the voice of God? I suppose, too, we could say that oftentimes we're more motivated by the criticisms of others, of the, of the way we, we avoid uh, being criticized and we avoid uh, confrontation. And, and so we will listen to those voices more than the voice of God. You see... Prayer is a place where we get clarity about what God would have us to do. God, Jesus went out and he said, he said I, I know I'm going to need some clarity because the voices are going to be very loud to, for me to stay here, but I want to do what God wants me to do. And so he spent those times in intimate communication with God and he heard the clarity of God's voice. You see, intimacy takes us to a place of, of clarity. How often is it that that when we are very close to someone, we can almost anticipate their thoughts. Well, prayer is the gateway for that in our lives so that we can, there are times we can anticipate what God is going to say to us. And I, I wonder if Jesus, through that intimate connection he had with God, knew that 
that God had other arrangements for that day. And so he went to other towns as well. Uh, the other story is about Peter. And again, the, the, the story happens in Capernaum because that was Peter's hometown. Jesus comes along and he teaches this large group of people. And then he tells Peter, let's go out and go fishing. And Peter knows better. Peter is an experienced fisherman and he knows that you don't go fishing in the middle of the afternoon. The water is too hot. The fish are too low. They won't, they won't catch anything. And what's even worse about it is they had not caught anything all night. And Jesus says, listen, let's go out. Let, let go out there and, and cast your net and, and watch what I can do. Peter, Peter has watched as Jesus has gained all this popularity. And people are just like, this guy's a miracle worker. But he knows they're not going to catch fish. And so I, I honestly believe that Peter's response to Jesus is more of a, a protection. I want to protect Jesus because uh, I, I don't want him to be embarrassed by this. And, and I think probably there was a little bit of motivation on, on Peter's part to say, I don't want them to think I'm stupid. They're going to see me going out and throwing my net in the middle of the afternoon, knowing that there's just no way you're going to catch fish in the afternoon. How often, how often we're more embarrassed about Jesus than we should be. And we don't take risks. We don't venture out because we don't want to put Jesus on the line. We don't want to risk Jesus's reputation. So we back off and we don't, we don't venture out. We don't, we don't do things that God asks us to do. Intimacy with Jesus is all about trusting in his direction and then putting it into action. There's a point of absolute submission to the will of God. It's a commitment to God's voice. You see, intimacy implies a, a commitment. And, and when we're in the intimate relationship with God, there's a, a greater sense of commitment to do what he asked us to do. The disciples saw that. They, they began to realize that, that if they were going to have a, some kind of closeness with God, they, they, they needed to know how to go into those kind of prayer times where there was a, a deep level of commitment. And Jesus then instructs them that way. They, they go to Jesus and they ask him, teach us to pray. What essentially they're saying is, teach us the path to this kind of closeness. Tell us, Jesus, how it is that you have gotten this sense of intimacy with God the Father. And so Jesus teaches us to pray. Last week we looked at our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Today I want to look at your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think the thing that we need to do to be able to understand this phrase from the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer is to personalize it. We need to personalize, may your kingdom come. Rather than think about geopolitical kingdoms, which the people around Jesus in his day, they, they got that all wrong. And I think today still, we, we think in terms of nations and, and territories more than we think of the spiritual nature of God's kingdom. Jesus himself said, my kingdom is not of this world. When, when Pilate asked him, are, are you a king? Yeah, I'm a king, but, but you don't get it. it. There's a deeper reality about the kingdom of God. You see, God's kingdom at this moment is personal and it's spiritual. It's a, a, a rule of God that, that goes deeper than the political spectrum that we see here today. God's kingdom is all about God's justice. It's all about his love. It's all about his, his righteous reign in the hearts and the lives of believers, of followers of Jesus Christ. The, the kingdom of God is, at this time, it's, it's confined to the, the community of faith. Some would call it the church. But it's the place where God reigns and rules. And and to have that intimacy with him, he needs to rule in your heart and your life. The kingdom of God is about God ruling and reigning in your heart and my heart and the, the hearts of all followers of Jesus Christ. It's all about God's change in our lives. See, first he, he changes us and, and then he changes the world. There, there are three tenses of this kingdom that we need to get squared away in our hearts and our minds. The first is a futuristic tense. The, 
The second is a, a present, more personal tense. And then the, the third area is a, an outworking of the, the personal uh, present moment to, to our actions, our, our, our being light and help and hope and justice and love in this world to, to spread his kingdom, to make his rule here on earth. So the first aspect of futuristic is that there is a future kingdom that will come, an, an ultimate consummation of the kingdom. And so that when we pray, may your kingdom come, there's this, this prayer, Lord, I, I want to live every moment of my life in anticipation, in anticipation of your return. Every moment of every day, I want to expect that you will come back in the next moment. I'm looking forward to the day when you do rule this earth. And I want to live in, in the present with the awareness that Christ will return and he will set things right. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says it this way. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. And throughout the scriptures, we're, we're given prophecy about the end times, not so that we can predict the future, but so that we can be ready. Are you ready? Are, are you focused? When, when you pray, may your kingdom come. Are you longing for the return of Jesus Christ? Priority number one is this. I, I want to live every moment as if in the next moment, Jesus would return. The second part, or the second tense of that, may your kingdom come, is found in the reality where we're praying, Lord, may your kingdom priorities be established in every aspect of my life. This is a very personal application of God's kingdom. It's a request for, for God's kingdom to come in me, to be revealed in my life. I want your kingdom priorities to change me. When you pray this prayer, it's a very dangerous prayer. It's a prayer of change. May your kingdom come, says, God, I want your kingdom in my heart and my life. I want you to rule every aspect of who I am, my character, my behavior, my conduct, my attitudes. Lord, I want you to truly be king in my life. Let's face it, we all have, we all have areas of our lives that, that are not part of the kingdom of God. Areas of our lives that we kind of hold back. We, we say, we, we'll let you take charge of these areas, but well, here, uh, here's where the line is. But every time I recite this prayer, may your kingdom come. I am to be saying to God, God, come and rule me. Come and reign in my life. Priority number two here then is that the, the God is the Lord of everything in my life. I, I make that a priority to keep looking and keep searching for any area that is outside his reign and rule. Any place that I have said, God, that's off limits. It's a constant progressive work of God, gaining ground, gaining territory in my heart and my life and reigning in me. And as he gains more of us, as he rules in our life more and more, there is an outworking of this inner kingdom into the world around us. It, it brings kingdom realities into the world in which we live. And that's the third tense here. And when we pray, my, may your kingdom come, we're praying, Lord, may I, may I have influence in this world with the priorities of your kingdom. You see, when God is working in us, when he is reigning in our hearts and our lives, we become the ambassadors of God's kingdom here in this world. We're here to be peacemakers. We're here to bring justice and truth and purity, hope to this world. Those are the key words of, of the kingdom of God. I like what Peter said about Jesus in Acts chapter 10, that Jesus went about doing good. We sometimes get down on people for good works, thinking that good works will earn us something. Well, they're not there to earn us something, but they are there to express something that is inside us. And if we want this intimate, 
personal closeness with God. We'll be people who act upon what he is doing in our lives. We will want to, to bring God's kingdom to bear, to bring that sense of peace, to bring a sense of hope, to bring light and, and help to this world that needs it so desperately. They will see God in us. Our, our testimony, our story about God's work in our life will bring help and hope to, to the people around us. So the third priority, the third priority that I need to live with if I'm going to be part of God's kingdom, if I'm really going to pray, may your kingdom come, is how can I be faithful to bring in kingdom priorities to bear upon this world? God, today, how do I make your kingdom real in the lives of people that I come in contact with? A futuristic, Jesus, I, I want you to come. May your kingdom come. May you come back and establish your throne. May your kingdom come rule in my heart and my life. And as you rule in my heart and my life, help me to make a kingdom difference in the world that I live. The second part of that first, or that second phrase is, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is a related phrase, I believe, to may your kingdom come. But it is a, it is a separate kind of issue for us to, to surrender our wills. The story that we heard about uh, the disciples and how they, and Peter especially, didn't want to take his boat out into the water. There's a moment of submission. Uh, one of the versions says it this way, nevertheless, because you say so, we'll go out and we'll, we'll go fishing in the middle of the afternoon. And while I, I sense that there was some hesitancy in Peter, Let's be real. When we're obeying God, I think a lot of times there's a little bit of a hesitancy. But I think that the more we grow in our intimacy with God, the more we, we, we grow in that sense of closeness, the less hesitancy there is. And, and we see that in Peter's life. We see a growing intimacy with God in Peter. And maybe this was the first step. And maybe today you need to take the first step, saying, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Wait a minute, that, that sounds really familiar. Yeah, even Jesus. Even Jesus had a moment in his life, in his ministry, in the, in the greatest act of love and care and sacrifice ever known. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, looking up to the Father, said, I, I know what your will is. I, I am understanding that your voice is really clear. But Father, if there's any other way other than the cross, oh, let it be so. And he heard no other response from God. We, we don't know what God said or if he said anything, but, but Jesus in that intimate moment with the Father, tears streaming down his face under such intense pressure that, that blood was seeping through his sweat glands. And Jesus says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. This is not about asking God to enact his will, to enforce his will on other people that we want to, to get right. This is this, this part of the prayer. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a personal commitment. Commitment plays such a huge role in intimacy. If we, want to be, if we want to be close to God, we have to be committed to God and to his will and to doing what he wants us to do. And my friends, it's not just the big things in life. It's not just our careers or the choice of spouse or where we're going to live. Those are the big issues. And I actually don't think those are as important as the more personal issues. As far as personal issues, what's God's will for you today? What is he calling you and asking you to do? Not asking you to change jobs or, or move to Saudi Arabia. I'm, I'm not talking about any of those kind of big decisions. I'm, I'm talking about what is he asking you to do personally today? What's God's will for you today? Now, we have to be careful here. Let me put a little caveat in here. 
and say that, you know, I've heard about, and I don't know if it's a mythical lady, but, but a woman who would get up in the morning, or let me put it this way, she would wake up in the morning, lay in bed until God told her it was time for her to get out of bed. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about God wanting to make changes in your heart and your life. Are you willing to make the changes? Are you willing to allow his power, his spirit, to make the changes that are necessary in you so that you can be God's kingdom representative here on earth? Is he asking you to forgive somebody? Maybe he's asking you to forgive a lot of people. Forgiveness is a big, big block to any kind of intimacy. Maybe he's asking you to go ask forgiveness of someone. Sometimes that's even harder than forgiving, isn't it? To say, I was wrong, will you forgive me? Maybe it's, you need to be truthful, honesty, transparency. You see, transparency, authenticity is another great synonym for intimacy. We, we meet with others face to face and and if we're going to meet face to face with God, if we're going to have intimacy with him, we need to work on our, the closeness, the, the honesty that we have with one another. Maybe I need to confront sin and may, or, or maybe I need to talk to somebody else about their sin. God's asking me to, to take a stand. That's hard. It's difficult. Maybe it's just to talk to someone about Christ and my relationship to him. What's God's will for you today? Is doing God's will the greatest priority in your life? Do we understand that doing God's will is the path to intimacy with him, to joy, fulfillment, peace in our lives? You see, we, we get scared that doing God's will is going to make me uncomfortable. And my friends, that is the place. That's the place where his love, his grace, his goodness, all of, the, all of the things that we intimately want to know, closely want to know, find its fruition. I'll ask it again. Is doing God's will, I'm not talking about the big things now, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the personal things, the, the things that are within your heart and life. Is it, is it your greatest priority? May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Does that drive you throughout your day? A.W. Tozer has, a, I think, a, a good analogy that, that helps us to, to grasp the significance of this truth of God's kingship in our heart and our life. He points out that uh, a number of Surveys have been done over the years in the United Kingdom and Great Britain, uh, wanting to know if people wanted to do away with the royal family. And an overwhelming majority of people, time and time after time after time, have said, no, we want the king and the queen. We, we want the, the royal family as, as part of our national identity. And I, I think it's great. I, I wish my country had some kind of national identity like that. When parade comes by and the queen is there in her carriage and or even some of her children or grandchildren are there the, the the throngs of people come out they're waving flags they're cheering it's a it's a great celebration but you know when when it time, comes time for real decisions that mean real change the queen doesn't have much say in things now, she has an opinion like everybody else but the real power for decision-making lies in the parliament. And so when, when it comes time to make those big changes, the attention is given not to the royal family, but to parliament, because they're the ones that will make the decisions. And you see, a lot of people are like that, are like, like that relationship with the royal family in Britain. They, they like Jesus, they go to church, they sing, they hoop and holler and clap, and, and they love to sing those great songs of the praise to Jesus. But, but when it comes time for the real decisions in their lives that will make real changes in their lives that will impact this world for the kingdom of God, well, then they make the call. They make the decision. The power lies in their will. 
not in the will of the Father. And you see, to have that intimacy with God, to have that closeness with God, we, we need to make that change. We, mean, we need to make the change from just the, the, the national identity or the, the kind of sense of, oh, this is wonderful, to, yeah, I'm going to make the hard decisions and follow Jesus. I'm going to make him king and ruler of my life. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a very dangerous prayer to pray. But my friends, it is a, it is a part of the prayer that leads us to closeness with God, which is something we all crave. We long for a deeper walk with God. Pray that with me, would you? May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we come to you and we, we sense our weakness. We sense the struggles that we have in, in surrendering to you. But I thank you. I thank you for the example of Peter out there in the boat saying, nevertheless, because you say so. And I pray, God, I pray for, for, for the people watching and listening to this message right now. Maybe they're in the shoes of, of Peter right now. And, and I pray that you will give them the courage. You'll give them the, the, the insight to be able to say, yes, Jesus, I want to make you king. I want to make you ruler. I want your kingdom to come in my heart and my life today. Lord, to you be the glory. This is all about your glory, not my comfort. It's about the glory of the kingdom in this world. Make it so, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's join together and sing. Here
I want to end today's service uh, reading a psalm again and allowing you to meditate and take that psalm into your heart and your life. It's a, a psalm about the kingdom of God. Psalm 145 reads like this. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to the, another, and they will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of your power, of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all, his compassion on all he has made. All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all his promises, loving towards all he has made. The Lord upholds those who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at, at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfies, satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving towards all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears the cries and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Every creature praise his name forever and ever. Amen. My friend, God wants to establish you as an instrument of the glory to his name. That is a path to intimacy, to, to glorify his name. And, and to glorify his name is a moment of surrender and peace. May this week you find a, a path, the, the path of life that you trod, be a, a time of surrender, of of grace and mercy and peace, ruling your heart and life, and then being an instrument of God's kingdom in this world. Go in the grace and the goodness, the closeness of God. And God's people said, amen, amen. Hey, have a great week and we'll see you later.